Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be taking all those MFM hard drives from the video last week and hooking them up to a test bench with MFM controllers to see which work. If you haven't watched part one, well, I recommend you might wanna check that out first. Although it's not necessarily important, especially if you know a whole lot about MFM hard drives, then really what this video is gonna be about is seeing how many of these old unreliable five hard drives I have actually work and how many don't work. After the intro, I'm gonna jump right into testing these hard drives with my 46 test bench. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Okay, I have my 46 test bench set up right here. I have the 16-bit uh, Western Digital controller plugged in with some ribbon cables ready to go. I was gonna try this ST4000 whatever, this large full height hard drive, when I noticed that there's some serious corrosion right here. So I don't think this drive is necessarily going to work. The fact that there's all this corrosion here means that this whole part of the drive was probably in water for a very long time, which resulted in this. Let me grab some deoxit and a little bit of magic eraser, and let's see if we can try to get that looking better. But if that doesn't clean up, I think there's really gonna be no hope for this drive. And at least we'll spin it up and see if it can even turn. Oh yeah, there's, there's no hope, I don't think, for this thing. This is in... Very bad shape here. All right, well, I think at the minimum, let's just see if we can spin this drive up and, and hear it work or you know try to work at least. That's one thing about mechanical hard drives is they do not enjoy getting submerged in water. That is really not good for them. So don't let that happen to your drives. All right, I'm gonna take my wireless mic and I'm gonna put it right next to this hard drive so you can hear it spin if it does at all. All right, that is a very unhappy hard drive. That did not sound right, especially that screechy noise that it was making and the fact that when the heads tried to access, the disc was spinning down. There's probably corrosion on the discs themselves. Uh, this drive is gonna be a goner and at the end of the video, I'll open this thing up. All right, let's go to the next Seagate drive, the ST225. I don't see any corrosion or potential water damage on this thing. So let's just give this a spin before we plug it into the computer, make sure that it does actually spin, and then uh, we'll see if we can access data on this thing. All right, so this hard drive didn't spin up at all. Now, now, there's actually a problem that happens with these Seagates, and I remember this was a very common issue even back in the day, in the 90s when I worked in a computer store, the very early 90s, we'd get these drives all the time with a phenomenon that we called stiction. Essentially what was happening, at least to the best of our knowledge back in that time, and that was before the internet, was the read-write heads would kind of get stuck on the disk surface. So when the drive tried to spin itself up, it couldn't spin. There wasn't enough torque to break that, that connection between the heads and the disk. Now I remember back in the day that sometimes you could get these working by sort of twisting them while you powered them up to try to get the platter spinning in there or sometimes we would do extreme measures like take the hard drive and put it in the freezer, which I think would cause the disc to contract maybe at a different rate than the heads or whatever. And it would sort of break that connection where we could then let the drive actually warm up and then use the drive one last time to get the user's data off of it and copied onto a new hard drive. That was always the intent when we had drives with stiction was to just to recover the data. It wasn't to keep the drive running for forever because I don't think there was any particular fix for that problem. Now, of course, in 2023, we're trying to use these old hard drives again or have them working so we can put them in an old computer that can only use these types of hard drives. 
And stiction means that the drive won't be reliable. Now this drive might not have been used for 30 years, for instance, it could have been put aside and, and cast aside or stored improperly. So I'm gonna try to get this drive spinning here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna power this up. Oh, it spun up right there. Now that actually might not have been stiction. I think the problem is the cable, like the end cable on my power supply here has sort of a, I don't know, a slight, not a dodgy connection, but on some older drives, it doesn't make the perfect contact. And actually you could have an issue on the 12 volt rail. So I plugged it into this other connector here and now it seems to be working. Now, I don't think that sounded exactly right. Once it was spinning, the, the way the heads were making noise, sound a bit weird. I'm just gonna draw an S on here just to let me know that this drive is spinning. And I think I'm just gonna quickly go through all these drives to figure out which ones actually spin, which ones don't spin, and then we will try to get data reading and writing off of them. All right, this hard drive obviously is spinning, but it's something is very wrong with it. MFM hard drives pretty much always spin at 3600 RPM. And that has to do with the fact that the data rate is five megabits per second. And that really, I don't think can be different from one hard drive to another. Although that's, maybe that's not correct. This hard drive doesn't appear to have any speed control. It just starts spinning up and just keeps going and going and going, getting faster and faster until I think the motor runs out of steam. So I'm pretty much gonna say there's no way this hard drive works. That spin up procedure there just sort of goes on and it never seems to reach equilibrium where the drive is taken over and is holding the RPM at an exact controlled speed. So I'm just gonna draw an X on this and I think um, I won't be focusing on this drive in the rest of this video. Okay, that leaves this big Micropolis drive here. Let's see if this thing can work. Alrighty, well, it's spinning. There was some stiction there that I relieved by giving it the twist. It's really, really, really noisy. I don't know if this drive is possibly gonna work. I'm noticing here on the top, looks like the sticker's been peeled up uh, there and there, which might imply someone tried to go inside, although there are warranty stickers right there and those aren't broken, so I, I don't know what the deal is with that. This is really loud and it takes quite a long time to spin up there, but it sounds like it's reached equilibrium. You see like the speed control has taken over. It's regulating the disk speed. So this hard drive might actually be working. Well, even though I said on my note that this drive did spin at some point in the past, Certainly not trying to spin at this point. The light flashes on the front. I'm gonna try a little percussive maintenance to try to beat the stiction. 
There are some jumpers on there. I don't remember what I did before to try to get this drive working, but the fact is these old hard drives are incredibly unreliable. I mean, I've had drives that work as, you know, MFM type drives here that, I, that worked. I low leveled them, got them working, they worked fine, put them aside. A year later, I got them out to test them again. They were dead. Like they didn't spin or it would spin up and I couldn't access it anymore. Unfortunately, these things were just not designed for long-term reliability. They were early days and some of them are more reliable than others, but uh, this fly-by-night PTI, I guess, not a reliable brand. So don't buy one of these if you're looking for a reliable hard drive. <laughs> All right, so there were a total of five hard drives and seems that two of them are the only two that actually have potential of working. And honestly, I think this Seagate 255 or 225 is the only one here that's actually going to work. This one just sounds very unhealthy. I don't think it's gonna work. So let's hook up the ribbon cables to the Seagate. We'll try with one that's the most likely to work and uh, see if we can format it and get data onto this thing. Okay, with the Seagate ST225, it is gonna be type two, I'm pretty sure. 615 cylinders, four heads, that means zero, one, two, and three. Pre-composition, landing zone, and sectors is 17. All right, when I hit F10 to exit the BIOS, the hard drive is making a you know, noise, like it's doing something. And the XT IDE, which I have my card in there, is tr trying to identify this hard drive. Now, normally, this would be something that the IDE bus would return the name of the hard drive. That's not gonna work. But it is making seek sounds, which is a good sign, actually. It's gonna hopefully boot. Uh, it says booting C. I'm sorry, I gotta look around the camera here. Booting C is, I think it's trying to boot this hard drive. So that's a good sign. Is the light flashing? Yes, the light is on as well. Looks like the computer has rebooted itself. I think what I need to do, okay, ROM basic. Okay, there's no basic. I think what I need to do is actually hook a floppy drive up to this machine and remove my XT IDE card here. And I'm just gonna boot off a disk, a floppy disk. And then hopefully I can low level this drive and I'll show you the tools that I use. Okay, so a floppy drive is hooked up. I'm gonna put in the DOS boot disk with Superstore on it. Now this clicking and trouble booting is normal when the hard drive is not low leveled or is low leveled with a different type of controller that this one doesn't understand. So it's trying to access the disk here to see what kind of partition tables on it or whatever. And that's clearly not gonna work. So I'm gonna need to get booted off this A disk here and try low leveling this particular drive before we can try to get away from this um, weird noise it's making. Drive still could be bad though. That could be also the problem. It seems that my Mr. BIOS here has an auto search and also a screen prompt for the boot menu. So I'm gonna actually try the screen prompt one, see if that gives me some more options to try to get this computer booted. Cause it's just struggling here trying to get this drive to, to boot. Okay, boot from floppy F1. Let's uh, see if that's gonna work. Okay, it's loading off the disc. It's gonna keep trying to access the disc as DOS loads cause that's normal DOS behavior. Uh, we're just gonna go right into Superstore and try to low level this drive. Now, a lot of times with controllers like this that have their own ROM on here, there's actually a ROM entry point which you can run with the debug command, which has utilities to low level the hard drive built right into this ROM. So you just need to be able to boot to a DOS disk and run debug. You gotta check the documentation for your disk controller. It's generally like C800, the address you gotta run to, but it's not always that. So like I said, check your documentation. Of course, with a 16-bit card like I have in this computer, we don't need to use uh, a ROM-based utility because the built-in BIOS already supports accessing the hard drive, but the built-in BIOS normally doesn't have a low-level format utility. Some of them do, but the original IBM doesn't and, and nor does this. So we're gonna run, I think it's Superstore. It might be Speedstore. I always mix up the names. Uh, this is a great utility that was contemporary back in the day. I used this when I worked in a computer store. Uh, speed store, that's the name of it here, storage dimensions. And this is used to verify the hard drive is working, low level it, stuff like that. You do have to set your BIOS correctly ahead of time with the number of heads and cylinders or whatever before you try to low level the drive though. So just make sure if you're using a drive that you know you don't know what the heads and cylinders are, Google to look that up and then put that into either a custom type or find a matching BIOS hard drive type that matches the specifications of your drive. Now, normally, if this drive were formatted and working and it was making noises like this, where it keeps making a bunch of clicky noises, I would be worried that there's a problem with the drive. But because it may be a low leveling issue, look at this, unable to establish drive types. 
Okay, that's, that's a bit worrisome. So we're gonna go into manual setup here and do initialize. Now you could type defect manager and type in the defects that are on the sticker here, but I'm not even gonna bother. I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna do standard init. This will destroy all data. Yep, well, it doesn't seem to be working anyways. Um, we're not, not gonna enter the, the locations. The interleave does matter. Um, unfortunately, there's no easy way to know what is the right setting for your computer. If you have it wrong, it could result in a really slow performance of the disk. And unfortunately, um, there's a bit of a nuance to figure out what the right speed is. It depends on your CPU, the type of interface card, the type of hard drive. There's quite a number of parameters. A utility like SpinWrite can actually help you determine what the right interleave is. But I'm just gonna leave it at three, which is the default. And let's hope that this thing can actually initialize. We'll know very quickly once we start this, if this drive is working or not. Okay, so right off the bat, this is not a good sign. The drive is making a clicking noise and it's not even formatting at all. I have a feeling this is gonna air out immediately. I'm gonna put the drive on its side here. So I can feel with my thumb on the little stepper motor assembly, which is right here. I can just put my finger on this little um, spindle, which is on the little stepper motor. And I can feel that it is moving the heads back and forth. But the fact is, it's not able to initialize the formatting. If we look back in here, it hasn't even began formatting. And when this works, it goes very quickly. It just starts at like 6.15. Oh, it failed right away. Controller fails to respond. So I think what's happening is the drive is never becoming ready. There's a signal that comes over the cables from the drive back to the controller to tell the disk controller that the drive mechanics are working and it's ready. And like that track zero signal, if the controller tries to go to track zero, you should get a track zero signal. If the controller doesn't get that, it's just gonna keep trying over and over again. And eventually it's just gonna give up because it thinks that the drive itself is not working. Now I know not everyone's gonna be able to do this, but I'm gonna turn off the computer here. And I'm gonna grab another one of these Seagate drives, one that I think works, like I've used before. And I'm gonna try to hook that up and just validate that my cabling and the controller is working. Because that's one of the problems. When you run into a situation where you have like lots of variables, you have a hard drive you might, that might not work, you have cables that might be bad, you have a disk controller that might not work. There's just a lot of things that may be wrong. So having a spare drive that you know works is just gonna help me eliminate that everything on my computer is good and it's just the drive that's malfunctioning here. And here we are, this is another of these drives. It says type two on here. This was in my box of formatted and working drives. So I know that this thing well, it worked when stored. You know, that doesn't mean anything because it's probably been a year since I've used it at, or more. I try to break out my hard drives periodically, these old MFM drives, basically get them working, like try to exercise them a little bit just to, just to ensure that they work. And then when they break, I get rid of them, I recycle them. Okay, please wait for the drive to spin up. So it sounds the same exactly right now as the other drive. It's sort of making a clicking noise. Okay, boot from floppy. I'm gonna go back to, uh, is it super super store or speed store? I already forgot, immediately forgot. Okay, so right away the hard drive made a little seek noise, which I don't know if you could hear over the noise of the, the drive, but it didn't make any of that clicking noise. In fact, let's just see if it's working right now. Look at that, it's actually working. So this hard drive absolutely is functional right now. In fact, let's reboot and actually try to boot off this drive. I usually leave these things formatted with a DOS on them so that I can very quickly test them by just connecting them up to the, disc, the uh, controller. Uh, F2 to boot from fixed. There it is. It's actually booting off the hard drive. All right, so that validates right there that my cabling is good, the disc controller is good, the type two in the BIOS is good. I mean, I wrote that on this hard drive, so I know that's the case. And it's the same as this other one, but this other drive it just never starts responding properly. Now you should park these hard drives before you shut them off. And there it is, heads are parked. That just puts the heads in the landing zone. Later versions of these hard drives actually self park the heads and they use like the spinning disc uh, to generate a little power to then move the heads into the landing zone. But these old ST225s do not do that. The 251s do, which are 40 meg drives a little bit later, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna check on the bottom that these two look the same. So the terminating resistors there, you know, everything looks the same. 
And I just wanted to check the jumpers. There are jumpers. So there's just one jumper installed right there. This is the working drive. And on the non-working drive, there we go. Same thing, just one jumper in the same spot. So that unfortunately is a really, really bad sign that this drive here is just dead. And unfortunately I have to say, when the drive is like this, where it spins up and it seems to be trying to access, but then it just never gives like the ready signal back to the controller. The controller just tries over and over again and um, you will we'll never have a working hard drive. Maybe with some schematics, we could try to do some engineering or some reverse engineering on this with a oscilloscope, try to figure out what exactly is going on. But beats me. It could be the read write heads are just no longer working, like they're disconnected inside the drive. There could be a ton of problems. And yeah, it's, it's doing exactly the same thing. If we switch back to the other input, it's waiting for the drive to spin up, but here, I'll let you listen to the noise it's making. And the BIOS ended up giving up and it just says fixed disk failure. And that's really, I think, because the ready signal never came back from this drive to the controller. So it just very quickly gives up. No amount of low level formatting is gonna make this drive work. There's something wrong either on this uh, board on the bottom of the drive, or maybe the stepper motor's not stepping the heads properly, or maybe the heads themselves aren't working. There are a ton of problems that could be wrong with this drive. And because it's mechanical in nature, it can be very, very difficult to troubleshoot. Now, I just had a thought actually, one of the things we could try is take this controller off the working drive and put it on the non-working drive to see if you know we can read the data off this. The thing is, I'm worried that there might be something wrong with like say the heads are shorted out on this drive. And what if that damages the read write head amplifiers on this board? And if I put my good board on here, it might damage this one as well. And without schematics, how exactly am I supposed to troubleshoot what might be wrong? With a service manual for the 250 or 225, maybe with a scope, we could try to figure out like what's going wrong here. But unfortunately, I don't think I've ever seen a service manual like that. If you're aware of a service manual for these 225s, I won't junk this hard drive right away. I'll just uh, mark it as bad and set it aside. And perhaps if there's a service manual, we could try to actually fix this. Obviously not in this video, but in another one. Hey, I can definitely say that I have probably worked on here in the basement, 50 ST506 type hard drives, like MFM drives. And of all of the ones I've had come through, I always check them, do a full thorough test on them. If I can low level them, I'll low level them, run them through a you know full diagnostic with a, a surface scan and whatnot. I think I have about seven or eight drives that work. The rest have all been broken in one way or another, and I've had to recycle them. It's just the unfortunate nature of these old hard drives. So I'm gonna write spins and not working on this drive, and let's move on to this really un unhealthy sounding Micropolis and see if we can get at least one of the drives working from this set of five. All right, Micropolis is hooked up. Let's turn on the computer. Now it's still set to type two, right? Which is the uh, 20 meg of the other Seagate drive, but that's okay. This hard drive, I doubt, has um, less cylinders than the Seagate drive, so it's not like it's going to try to move the head too far. And I don't even think the electronics would allow that to happen. So let's see if this thing ever becomes ready, even with Type 2. And wow, this thing is loud! All right, waiting for the drive to spin up, so at least it sees that there's a drive there, I guess. Well, the drive is spun up, and it's... It's not even attempting to access. So I think this drive is bad as well. And unfortunately we have the same old hard disk failure. I'm gonna go look up the heads and cylinders though, just in case that somehow makes a difference. It really shouldn't though. And uh, let's see what happens. Uh, before looking up those, that information, looks like this thing has like a service mode. You take these two screws off, which are captive. Looks like you can flip this board up. Kind of neat, actually. Let's see if everything looks like it's connected properly. Let's move this over here and move this over here so we can all kind of see together what we're looking at. So this is the spindle right here, which we know is working, obviously, and it's seemingly controlled by this ribbon here, which goes to this main board. 
This main board here has the connector for the Molex, uh, power regulation and stuff that goes in here and this supplies five volts to this. And obviously this thing probably spins it up. This kind of got a fan going on here. And this is a brake right here. See this assembly right there. So that makes it a loud click when the drive powers up. That really allows this to spin freely, I think. And then these cables right here would be the read-write cables. They go down to this PCB down here, right there. That's probably what goes into the drive to get to the read-write heads. Now, I'm glad I looked under here because I noticed that there's a drive select jumpers right here. And remember, these drives support 0, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, 4. And it looks like this is set for drive select 2. And we should have it on drive select 1. And as in 2, as in drives like one. Like I'm setting it now for drive zero or the very first drive, which is marked on this PCB as drive one. So if you're working on one of these drives and it doesn't seem to be responding to the drive controller, like just there's no activity, then I would basically double check that the drive select is set correctly. If it is trying to read it, like it's accessing things and making it do stuff like that other Seagate drive, and then it's still not working, that would imply that there's a mechanical problem on the drive. But this drive, it would spin up and there wasn't even any signs of life. Like I saw no flashing, no nothing, which just kind of screamed that there might've been a problem while either with the electronics or there was an issue with the, uh, the jumpers on the drive. We're ready to go, let's turn this back on and switch the input so you can see what the computer is doing. All righty. Please wait for the drive to spin. Oh, the, the red light's on. Okay, so there's a red light on the front of the drive. Now that it's on, really good sign. Uh, hopefully it's gonna boot up the disc. Uh, boot from floppy, yes. Let's do that. So we don't know what's on this drive, if anything, but it didn't say error. So I think that means that this drive is sending back to the controller that it's ready and maybe at track zero right now. So that's a really good sign. So we can see that it's currently set for that Seagate drive, which is definitely not this. Let's just do seek test though. It's seeking. I, I mean, I feel it doing stuff. So, okay, this is a good sign. It's just really good sign. I assume this drive was dead. I gotta go look up what this is and we're gonna type in the heads and cylinders into the BIOS. Here it is, a quick Google returned exactly what this is. So 1,024 cylinders, eight heads and 33 sectors per track. This is a beefy hard drive. There it is, unformatted capacity. 85 megabytes, 69 megs formatted. Wow. Now, wait a second. I just noticed here it says 138 megabytes. That doesn't seem right. And yeah, I didn't think it did. And look here on this other page. This shows 17 sectors per track, which is a much more appropriate amount of sectors per track for a drive like this. So if I tried to low level it, it wouldn't have damaged it. It just wouldn't have worked properly. So we'll just fix this to 17, hit enter, escape, F10, and let's try that low level again. All right, here we go again with the initialization. I'm not gonna bother typing in all these bad sectors that are on the label here. I'll just do a surface scan afterwards and hopefully it finds those and then maps them out on its own. It wants me to type in the interleave. I, I don't know what it should be, so I'm just gonna leave it at one, I guess. And here we go. So that's working. Remember on the other drive, it just sort of sat there and did nothing. Notice the lights on here. So this, this is the way it should actually work while it's low leveling your hard drive. Hmm, watching the format here, it's going kind of slow. Which could imply a problem, although I, I can't remember if this is actually verifying the hard drive as it does the low level, but I think it actually might be. So it might've been it was, it was struggling with some of those sectors there, which we may just need to run spin right after this format is done to truly map out all those bad sectors that are on this drive, all the marginal sectors that are on this drive. All right, well, the low level format has completed and now it is scanning the media. I actually canceled the low level format and I typed in the bad sectors, but look at what's happening here. All of these uh, green background entries are found during this media scan. And I'm gonna say this hard drive is not gonna work properly. Clearly there's something seriously wrong on that head one. And uh, we're up to 85 entries already. It kind of got, oh, it just scrolled over to the next page. I was gonna say it got through the first, I don't know, 100 or so tracks. And then it just started creating one after another. But look, now it's just consecutive, well, nearly consecutive bad sectors all on that first head. All the other heads seem to be working okay. 
Oh, okay, now it's even making weird, like retrain noises, like that, like the head is trying to uh, retrain back on the track. So, yeah, I think, um, I think unfortunately this drive is also uh, a goner. I'm gonna let it finish, and then we'll see if we can get DOS working on this and, and booting off of it. But I'm not, I'm not holding my breath that this drive is actually gonna work properly. It's sort of working, but certainly, yeah, it's making weird noises right now. It's, um, it's not gonna work very well. All right, there we go. Defect table overflow, um, 198 entries is all it can do. Do you wanna add these? I'm just gonna say yes, bad tracks are being marked. It got up to uh, 544 and that is it. Initialization is complete. DOS is gonna ignore all of those sectors that were marked as bad or those tracks that were marked as bad, but then it's going to try to, um, well, it's gonna try to use all the rest of the stuff on head number one there, which clearly is bad. So the format command can also mark out bad sectors, I think. Um, what's happening here? There we go. Hit yes. And here it goes, it's gonna begin formatting. The problem is, is this is definitely gonna have issues as well because it's gonna start hitting those bad sectors that aren't marked out as bad in that whatever special area of the drive that Superstore marked those sectors on. So DOS is gonna actually try to use those bad sectors those higher ones up on uh, head number one there. And there it is right away, trying to recover allocation unit 1693. This may work, but it's gonna take a very long time. And yeah, like I already said, unreliable hard drive, not recommend you use stuff like this. Well, I've been trying to format this thing with DOS here for a while and I think it's, I know you can't see on the screen where it's at, but it's at like 54% and it's going so slowly because it keeps retraining the head. So at this point, I'm gonna cut my losses. In fact, I can't deal with the noise anymore. I'm just turning off the uh, hard drive here to switch the input. It's so loud. There's no way it was this loud when it was new. I can't imagine. Oh, like my ears. I, I'm, I'm sure I was yelling over the top of my lungs there. You know what, so um, I'm gonna call this drive, well, you know, it could work. I suppose back in the day, this was your only hard drive. You could try to get data onto it. I mean, like not trustworthy, but it, yeah, it would work. Let's take the cover off of this thing and just take a look on the inside. You know, I know people are probably gonna be like, oh, you shouldn't take it apart. It still could be made to work. I mean, it's so loud. It, it's, I've heard so many hard drives over my life. I have never heard one as loud as this. The, the eight inch mystery hard drive isn't even as loud as this thing. Screw under these stickers here. The warranty is now void, everyone. I can no longer try to return this thing to Micropolis for RMA service. Oh no. All right, there it is. There it is, there's the inside. So yeah, voice coil, let's turn it on. Here we go. I can hear a, a head dragging in there. It's gotta be that head one. Wow, the noise, the noise. So there it is, the heads. I'm gonna run Superstore and let's, um, let's see if we can see the heads seeking on a random seek test. All right, let's run diagnostic seek test. And there it is. Look at that, we're gonna go. <laughs> I mean, it's always amazing to see mechanical things like this operating. It's, it's so loud, but that head assembly is quite large and it's moving pretty quickly there, which is pretty amazing, right? Incidentally, when I put my hand right here, I can feel pretty strong air current blowing out of the hard drive case. And if we take a look at the front cover, which I'll bring back over, you see this thing? It's got an air filter thing in here. So I guess that air current is blown into this, maybe down here or something. And it actually filters out any dust that might be inside the drive there. Let's turn it off and see if the heads park. They do automatic head parking on this really, really noisy drive. I have no idea if anyone's even able to hear me over how loud this thing is. 
All righty, let's uh, switch to that other Seagate corroded drive and let's open that thing up and take a look inside. So first thing I need to do is figure out how to open this. I think I got to remove this uh, top board. And then I think there are some screws or bolts that could uh, I remove to get that cover off. Let's turn up the torque here. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a bolt, all right. And it's got a lot of corrosion on it. Yep. Okay, this one here is where all the corrosion was. Oh, it's rusty. Okay, there we go. Oh boy. Yes, sir. -y. That. <laughs> that is not good right there. That is not how your hard drive should look on the inside. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. So you can kind of see all of this. I didn't touch the disc. That's not my doing. This must have been the part that was sort of submerged in the water. But you can see all of these grooves right here. So this obviously had a head crash. Well, or the head is dragging, which you can kind of hear. Let me move the microphone closer. I'm sorry if that sounded like nails on a chalkboard, but um, yeah, this hard drive was never ever gonna work properly again. Okay, and this PTI drive, this is the one that used to spin and now it doesn't spin at all. Uh, let me just try one more time and then let's open it up and see if I can manually start the spindle to get this thing to actually spin. Cause I think it's trying to spin. Yeah, it's not, not doing anything. Is the light flashing on it? Yeah, we got a little flash. Okay, so let's open this thing up. It's the same size bit. Nope, one smaller. Okay, I've removed the screws and I'm gonna break the warranty seal so I can't get my warranty service done on this drive company that is completely defunct. Let's uh, power up the computer here and see if we can turn this. Oh, this is stuck. That is stuck. That is so stuck. Oh, there we go. Okay, there it goes. So it was absolutely stuck to the heads. Okay, so I'm gonna put the cover back on now that it's spinning, even though it's um, making weird noises there. Let's put this on carefully. It's got the air filter thing in there. Okay, it has a rubber seal on it, so just placing it on there is gonna be okay. But it was so stuck and I really had to turn hard and then it came free. There was no way it would have come free like that without me manually intervening. I don't know. Okay, let's plug in the cables. Let's see if we can get this thing to actually do anything. Now that it's actually spinning. Boy, this is a bad instructional video. Do not do what I'm doing here. Like this is, this is recipe for damaging or killing your hard drives. Okay, switch inputs to the computer. All right, I'm just gonna go to the default to type two. That's kind of like the, uh, you know, the default that's gonna mostly work at least kind of for everything. Um, but like the drive is not spinning now. It's obviously waiting for a spin up, which is gonna be forever. So let's power cycle this. And I'm gonna give it a little percussive maintenance. There we go. It's spinning itself up right now. Sounds okay. Oh, but there it just spun itself down. None of these ST506 drives have a command to spin up. That's just not, there's no signal for that. There's no command for that. The only thing the controller can do is move the head in and out, write data, read data, that kind of stuff. There's no way for it to spin up and down the drive. So this drive spins itself down when it figures out that something is catastrophically wrong, which is a function of the drive itself, has nothing to do with the computer, which is why the computer is gonna be sitting there and saying, waiting for drive to spin up, because that's, it doesn't know the drive's not spinning, it just knows that it's not ready. Yeah, this sounds like it's got a head crash. When it's doing the little seek testing, uh, I think where the heads got stuck to the disc, it often damages the disc surface. And where it's parked right there, I could hear it making a ticking sound as it was spinning past the head. That's not happening on this top surface that we can see. It's gonna be on one of the lower surfaces that we can't see. Let me take these screws out here and let's, um, let's take a look at what these discs look like underneath here. Now taking the discs out, the correct way to do it would be to take the heads out first. So you kind of slide them out from the disc there. Because obviously if I 
uh, take these discs out, it's going to scratch them on the heads, but we're just going to do it anyways. Okay, so disc one, whoops, okay, I'm touching it, so that's going to put fingerprints on it. There is a small scratch right there. Let's look at the back side. Ah, look at that scratch there. That wasn't me or anything. That was something done um, by the heads. Oh, I'm noticing that the heads are offset. That is interesting. All right, the second platter. Oh, it's got scratches. Look at the scratches there. Hope those are showing up in the camera. Doesn't look good. This side looks a bit better. There's a little spacer here. It's like highly finely machined pieces of metal here. And there are three platters. So this thing had six discs in it. You know, I have the power on right now. Let's turn this on like this <laughs> without the clamp on there and see what happens. <laughs> that was really loud and horribly obnoxious. Let's try that one more time here. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. Yeah, not recommended. <laughs> Don't do that. Do not do that. <laughs> All right, I'm just trying to get the discs out. So I have to bend the heads out of the way and get the disc. So there is a big scratch right there on there. I mean, that could have been exactly where the heads were stuck. And then remember, I forced the spindle to turn and it probably went there. I, I don't know if that was a, if that was what happened. Uh, this side of the disc looks good. Oh, it's got scratches too, though. So who knows? But we know that the heads were stuck there, which I've gone ahead and I just bent out of the way. Spindle, though, let's turn this on now with no disc attached. So it very quickly gets up to speed. Then it's like, hey, something's wrong here. Like, I don't know what's going on. I can't read the uh, discs. I wonder why. And then it spun itself down. <laughs> and my camera just shut off, as you can see. It says no signal. And yes, it's inverted because of the way the camera's mounted. And it says battery exhausted. Okay, we're gonna have to switch to the camera. So obviously this hard drive spun once before, that's what the note said but it said it couldn't, it didn't respond, which meant the computer was getting, you know, giving hard drive error as messages like the other ones were doing. But now I had that stiction problem and when I broke it, it scratched the disc and that was that. So this, this hard drive was never gonna work again. Now, these discs are pretty cool looking, but I've opened up many hard drives in the past and these look cool. So if you have dead hard drives, I recommend opening them up, taking a look at what's inside. Do be careful though, that new modern hard drives actually use glass platters. This is almost certainly metal. I don't have a magnet handy, but this was probably a metal plate. It feels like metal, but the new ones are glass. So if you force things, they can break and make sure you wear gloves and stuff. So this video has been a complete bust. Five hard drives, I figured at least one of them would have worked and yeah, none of them worked. The Micropolis drive kind of tried to work, but clearly that drive was failing. That entire head one was bad. So if I'd left that thing for many, many, many hours in the DOS format there, I suppose it would have worked. But can you really trust a hard drive that has an entire dead head? Not to mention the extreme noise of that thing. But all the rest of those drives, just not working. Now there is that Seagate ST225, which kind of tried to work. Like it sounded like it should have worked, but yet it never gave the ready signal back to the controller. So if anyone can find that service manual, maybe that's worth a deeper dive. I am slightly hesitant to take the controller off the other working drive and put it on there because I'm just worried that it could cause a problem. And if I had the service manual, I could at least, at least try to do some diagnostics first to check if any of those things are shorted first, if I knew the correct values and things like that. But definitely put a comment down below if you want me to try to dig deeper and if the service manual is available. Now, even though everything was a fail in this video, I did want to give a realistic example of how unreliable these old hard drives are. Like I had mentioned, I've gone through so many of these drives and so many of them don't work. And plenty of that worked for me and I low level successfully got DOS booting, everything, put it away a year later and it was dead. They drop like flies. We can't really fault these companies. This was the very early days of miniaturization of hard drives and they just were learning on how to do it. As the manufacturers made more drives, they got better at the miniaturization and the reliability. And there are plenty of drives like that IBM drive, which is probably from the early 90s and it still works absolutely perfectly and it's nice and quiet as well. 
Now, if you have a system that requires an MFM hard drive, like you cannot replace the controller with something else, which means you're not using a PC, because if you're using anything that's PC compatible, well, at least one that has ISA slots, you can put an XD IDE in there and pretty much get up and booting. But there are plenty of other systems that use these ST506 type MFM hard drives that are not PC based. So just simply popping an XT IDE or even like a SATA or some other modern compact flash card is not that easy. For those systems, there is this. This is actually an MFM or ST506 hard drive emulator. Now I made a video about this. It uses a, what, a Beagle bone, I think here. And there are super caps for allowing this thing to keep powered up. So when you shut the computer off, it's able to save any changes back onto the Beagle bone. But this thing not only can emulate one of these hard drives, four-year-old systems, but you can also take one of those drives that's working and connect it up to these connectors on this board here. And then this can actually save what's on that hard drive, make an archival image onto this system. And you can use ethernet here to copy the image off of it. What's great about that is plenty of those hard drives used on non-PC systems are gonna have formats on them that might be completely different and incompatible to whatever the controller is that's used on the original IBM 5160, which I have sitting right here. In that case, the PC is not gonna be able to read whatever data is on there, but this thing should be able to. It's just gonna take that raw bitstream data and save it to a file. In addition, you can download a hard drive image off the internet and use this to write it back onto one of those where if you have a working drive, you could then put it into your computer and actually get it working. Now, this was a donation from Stuart and I have a mail call episode, I'm pretty sure, or some kind of an episode where I, I, I work on this thing and get it working. And I will link to that video down in the description below. And I will also put links down below to the programs I've used in this video, like Speed Store or Superstore or whatever it's called. <laughs> Can't believe I can never remember the name of that program. My entire life, I've gotten it wrong. S-Store, I'll put the link down below to S-Store so you can use that to format your hard drives to your heart's content. But please just remember that these hard drives are incredibly unreliable and there are so many things that can go wrong. And unfortunately, because the controller is just talking to a dumb hard drive, there is really no way for the hard drives to say, hey, this is wrong and this is why I'm not working. Only thing the controller can see is that the drive is not ready and then you get those generic hard drive not ready errors. So I hope you found this video interesting in some way. I'm sure I forgot plenty of information. This is not an exhaustive video, but please comment down below if you have stuff to add and maybe I'll try to make a pinned comment where I put all that useful information in one place. If you did enjoy this video, a thumbs up would be appreciated, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Uh, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, second channel if you haven't already, and a huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They get early access to videos and all that good stuff. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.